We welcome you with thankful hearts to this morning's worship of Almighty God, the one who summons the earth from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. Let's begin our worship now with prayer. O God, the strength of all who put their trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers, and because in our weakness we can do nothing good without you, give us the help of your grace, that in keeping your commandments we may please you both in will and deed, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Paul, like Mary, like John the Baptist too, pointed away from himself. We do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. If the early church at Corinth could hear this, they might avoid the trap of getting caught up in petty divisions and egotistical battles. The same is true for us. There is a blessedness in learning that we don't proclaim ourselves. We are, rather, like beggars sharing with other beggars where to find bread. We are sharing what God, by grace, has poured into our hearts. Reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The Gospel lesson recounts the Transfiguration, a most unique event that displayed the endorsement of Christ by a heavenly voice and gave Jesus confidence as he headed toward Jerusalem and the cross. The voice from heaven summoned Peter, James, and John, 
to obey Jesus in trust. Loving obedience is the hallmark of discipleship. Mark 9, verses 2 through 9. Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up to a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the Beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them any more, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The mountains of Israel, these magnificent peaks, hold special attractions for hikers. They offer a diverse array of terrain to explore. Some, like the 3,800-foot Mount Bental, were created by extinct volcanoes and give hikers the opportunity to explore a volcanic crater. And on a clear day, hikers can get to the top of the 3,900-foot Mount Marone and see both the Mediterranean Sea and Mount Hermon. The Hermon mountain range is a narrow mountain ridge that along its spine forms the Lebanon-Syria border. The highest peak in this range is the 9,200-foot Mount Hermon, which is capped with snow from December through May. Vegetation on Israel's mountains include a wide diversity of vegetation from lush Mediterranean forests to the stark Rocky Mountains of the Negev Desert. The mountains of Israel, though, are not just important for hikers and day trippers. 
They're important for all of us because on many of them, many of them were the sites of divine revelation. We look at Mount Carmel, for example. Here the prophets of Baal challenged Elijah's God to light a sacrifice by fire. Well, naturally, Baal was unsuccessful. To make the challenge even greater for Israel as God, Elijah poured water all over the altar before attempting to set it on fire. And no surprise that Israel's God met this challenge and consumed the sacrifice with fire. Then we learn about another mountaintop experience in today's gospel from Mark, another divine revelation, this time on Mount Tabor, the, what is considered since the early church as the traditional site of the transfiguration. Six days after leaving Caesarea Philippi, where Peter makes this profound, incredible confession to Jesus, you are the Messiah, the group arrived at a high mountain, believed again to be the 1,900-foot Mount Tabor. But Jesus takes only three of the disciples with him to the summit, Peter and the two brothers, James and John. The stage is now set for another divine revelation, with a mountain serving yet again as a place of God's particular closeness. None of what happened on that mountain, nor its timing within the Jewish festival calendar were coincidences. For the great events of Jesus' life were inwardly connected with this festival calendar. These events of the Jewish calendar were liturgical events in which the liturgy, with its remembrance of God's saving acts and expectation of Messiah, became reality, became life. It was on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, when Jews confess and repent of their sins and spend the day in fasting and prayer, that Peter confessed Jesus as Messiah. And Jesus disclosed his own future suffering, death, and resurrection. Then after a journey of some six days and on the final day of the Feast of Tabernacles, that festival which celebrates the ingathering of the fall harvest and recalls God's saving deeds in history, where remembrance turned to hope of God's definitive redemption through Messiah, the disciples themselves witnessed on that mountaintop the hope and expectation of Israel, where Messiah becomes reality before their dazed and dazzled eyes. And the connection is made between Peter's confession and Jesus' glorification through suffering, death, and resurrection. The disciples, overcome by fear of God like at other times when they witnessed his closeness in Jesus, sensed their own wretchedness and were paralyzed by fear as they learned that Jesus himself, Jesus himself is the living Torah, the complete word of God, as they see the power of the kingdom that is coming in Christ. It is hardly likely that the disciples, as they fell backwards in terror and fear, had the clarity of mind and heart to connect the dots of the Jewish calendar with this terrifying experience on the mountaintop. It was too terrifying, too astounding, and too incredible. But even so, they tried to find a way to remain in the presence of that terror. For what they had seen was Jesus not transformed, he was not metamorphosed, but he was transfigured in all his glory, appearing with a glistening gleam of burnished gold, appearing at one with the Father. Jesus is being in the light of God, his own being light as sun. This light which transfigured Jesus did not come from outside him, but from within. He doesn't simply receive light, but he himself is light from light. This entire episode spoke not of Messiah who would bring military overthrow of Rome or of simple physical liberation. No, he was to be not simply a wise, wonder-working rabbi. Here Messiah was revealed to be a suffering Messiah, something no one could comprehend. The Jews didn't want a Messiah who would suffer. They wanted some 
triumphalistic Messiah. But suffering, suffering, that was the key to this whole episode. It's what brought together the paradoxes of Jesus' life, for it wasn't in the miracles or even in the transfiguration that we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus, but only in the crucified one. It is only when we face the cross with Jesus that we can proclaim his earthly life to the world as the manifestation of God's glory. The hope brought by Messiah was one of suffering, his suffering as son of man, his suffering as a servant of God, and who by that suffering opens the door into freedom and renewal. In that moment, when Elijah and Moses, who were on that mount, when they saw the transfigured Jesus, they realized the consummation of all they had dreamt of in the past, and they saw in Jesus all that history had longed for, hoped for, looked forward to. This was the reality afforded to Peter, James, and John. What a privilege. And an opportunity to know without question that in Jesus was the long-expected suffering servant who was Israel's strength and consolation, the hope of all the earth, the dear desire of every nation, the joy of every longing heart. In our day, Theophanies, the fancy Greek word that means manifestation of God, those are quite rare in the Western world. You see, several centuries ago, Western societies fell prey to enlightenment teachings of the sovereignty of reason and the scientific revolution, which denuded and disenchanted a cosmos emptied of supernatural life. But St. Augustine reminds us what it's like to witness the transfigured light of God. In his Confessions, Augustine wrote, I saw your unchangeable light shining over that eye of my soul, over my mind. It was not the light of every day that the eye of flesh can see. Your light was altogether other than all such lights. It was above me because it made me. He who knows the truth knows that light, and he that knows the light knows eternity. Jesus' transfiguration on this mountaintop foreshadowed God's glorious enthronement of his Son after the degradation of the cross. A white flash of splendor brightens the dark cloud of tribulation that hangs over those who follow the Savior and is a promise that those who follow him will not have done so in vain. But none of this, none of this is really clear to Peter, James, and John. While the two brothers remain mute in the face of this dazzling reality, Peter felt compelled to act. He wanted to offer up as a gift shelters for Peter, or for James, sorry, for Jesus and Elijah and Moses. Now, Mark's Gospel doesn't tell us why he wanted to undertake this building project, but maybe, maybe he understood more than we give him credit. Understood the hard work ahead for Jesus as he descended the mountain and ascended the cross, and desired still in the face of his confession to prevent it, to settle down in the security of the mountaintop experience when we've seen the supernatural power of Jesus, when we've been confronted face to face with the incredible closeness of God in Jesus, we can only see and react to it all from a human perspective. Such proximity to divine intimacy muddles our thinking and clouds our minds with fear. We don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. Peter stammers before this mystery that's been revealed to him. But all any of us need to do is obey the Father's command. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. The odd thing is, though, that there on that mountaintop, Jesus never said a word, at least not then. But he had spoken seven days earlier that the Son of Man would suffer greatly. 
And he spoke again as they descended the mountain, saying, The Son of Man will go through many sufferings and be scorned. The prophet Elijah knew about great violence. It had been done to him, this one sent by God to proclaim Messiah. And the same would be done to Jesus, the Son. This is God's chosen way for advancing his kingdom through the death of his Son. The glory in the mountaintop offers assurance of ultimate vindication for Jesus, but does not remove the necessity of suffering for him or for those who follow him. Listening to Jesus for Peter, James, and John means keeping quiet and wrapping their minds around what Jesus says before and after the glory on the mountain. The text tells us that as they descend, for once they remain quiet. So much to think about, so much to come to terms with, so much trust needed in what Jesus said. For some of us to witness a divine revelation, we have to make a hard and rocky, steep climb up a narrow trail to a summit more than 1,900 feet. We catch our breath and quench our thirst and wait for Jesus to be transfigured, more brilliant than the hot Israeli sun. For us, like for Jesus and the disciples, this is a place of ascent where God's voice is heard through a cloud. And here, like the disciples, we witness a manifestation of Jesus in all his glory. It takes our breath away. But so powerful is this encounter with the living God, we can't speak of it. That moment with God's Son is too personal to talk about. And like Peter, we would have liked to build a shelter to remain in the midst of that mountaintop manifestation. But like those others so many years ago, we must descend. And as we descend, ponder what God said. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. The Spirit of God gives understanding. What we witnessed on that mountaintop, that's something to hold on to even when we cannot understand. There's a definition of the word witness as someone who first sees and then shows. Peter, James, and John saw. Then for the rest of their lives, they carried the message of Jesus' glorification on the cross and God's ultimate vindication by raising him from the dead. I have been to the mountaintop. I have seen Jesus' glory. And I believe in God's crowning endorsement of his son's resurrection from the dead. As followers of Jesus, we experience the cloud of glory. And in God's time, we all must tell the story that God's kingdom has already come among us in power through our Savior's suffering and cosmic glory. Please join me in praying to our Heavenly Father. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. We ask these prayers especially for Dale and Laura, for Molly and Philip, for Sharon and Steve, for Victoria and Elizabeth, for Greg, Dick, and Sonny, for Denise, Edie, and Tony, and for the, all those affected by the coronavirus, that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest, 
especially Jeanette Conger and John Papp. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. And teach us, O oh Lord, to listen, to hear, to live the words that Christ himself taught us when he prayed. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us so we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.